Muy buenos días. A nombre de las alumnas y los alumnos del programa del doctorado en Estudios Humanísticos de la Escuela de Humanidades y Educación de Tecnológico de Monterrey, Campus Monterrey y Campus Ciudad de México, les damos la más cordial bienvenida a la tercera edición del Foro de Estudios Humanísticos, Nuevos Horizontes, Florecimiento Humano en la Nueva Normalidad. El Foro de Estudios Humanísticos es un espacio de reflexión e investigación sobre el lugar y la importancia de las humanidades, tanto en el avance del, con del conocimiento humano como en el ámbito de la experiencia cotidiana. En esta tercera edición buscamos explorar el papel propositivo de las humanidades frente al panorama global actual, puesto que a raíz de la pandemia del COVID-19 nos hemos visto empujados y empujadas más que nunca a replantear y proponer nuevas conversaciones y soluciones a preguntas fundamentales que en algún momento pudimos dar por respondidas. Para dar formalmente inicio a esta semana de actividades, tenemos el honor de contar con la participación de nuestras autoridades invitadas. Doy la bienvenida al doctor Javier Alejandro Camargo Castillo, director del programa de doctorado en Estudios Humanísticos Campus Ciudad de México. Asimismo, contamos con la presencia del doctor Roberto Domínguez Cáceres, decano asociado de posgrados de la Escuela de Humanidades y Educación de Tecnológico de Monterrey. Finalmente, doy la bienvenida a la doctora Judita Aurora Ruiz Godoy Rivera, decana de la Escuela de Humanidades y Educación de Tecnológico de Monterrey, a quienes agradecemos enormemente su presencia. Le cedo la palabra al doctor Javier Alejandro Camargo Castillo, director del programa de doctorado en Estudios Humanísticos Campus Ciudad de México, quien nos compartirá unas palabras de bienvenida. Adelante, doctor. Muchas gracias. Eh, estoy muy contento de tener el regalo de la palabra y de su escucha para agradecer a los estudiantes del doctorado la orquestación de este tercer foro de estudios humanísticos que está por comenzar. Quiero agradecer a esta generación que ya en plena pandemia, en agosto 2020, decidieron estudiar un doctorado, algo que me llena de admiración hacia cada uno de ellos por el enorme compromiso que han mostrado en prácticamente este año y medio en que lo presencial no ha podido darse, pero el deseo por lo esencial en el estudio ha estado siempre fresco, nos ha cubierto, nos ha permitido atravesar los tiempos del COVID-19 de la mejor manera y con la mayor ternura posible. La vocación y la amistad en el aprendizaje van más allá de las plataformas y han encontrado su propia tecnología para hacernos un nosotros una comunidad. Quiero agradecer a esta generación el continuar con una tradición joven que ha pasado de estudiantes a estudiantes y ha encontrado una voz tanto dentro como fuera del Tecnológico de Monterrey. La primera edición del Foro de Estudios Humanísticos estuvo enmarcada en la Feria Internacional del Libro de Monterrey 2019 y estuvo dedicada a pensar la sustentabilidad de la ciudad de Monterrey y de manera expansiva al resto del país. En aquella ocasión participaron más de 20 ponentes en 11 eventos. La segunda edición, en octubre del 2020, se realizó de manera virtual y estuvo dedicada temáticamente a buscar la comprensión de lo que estaba pasando lo que estábamos viviendo a partir del tema disrupción de paradigmas, encuentros y desafíos. En ese segundo foro participaron más de 15 ponentes en siete actividades. Agradezco de corazón la generosidad de todas y todos los que hicieron posibles ambos foros que nos han hecho llegar hasta hoy, aquí, estar en un inicio más. Este tercer foro ha continuado el salto a lo virtual y prolongado el componente internacional de los ponentes y de las comunidades a quienes va dirigido. Tomando la estafeta de la generación anterior, de los estudiantes de ambos campus, nos convidan a estar en nueve ocasiones de contento, de aprendizaje, de interconexión, de encuentros. Muchas gracias a los 22 invitados que nos acompañarán en, las, en los siguientes días y a los 18 estudiantes organizadores. Me he demorado en las huellas de este foro porque los horizontes surgen del espacio vital desde donde contemplamos los rumbos posibles hacia dónde ir. El título de este tercer foro, Nuevos Horizontes, Florecimiento Humano en la Nueva Normalidad, me parece que entabla un diálogo con los foros anteriores. La sustentabilidad del modo de vida que tenemos y la necesidad de orientarnos en los momentos de cambio, pero ahora buscan el papel propositivo de las humanidades. Con esta apuesta me parece que reconocen la vulnerabilidad común que nos conforma y ha quedado desnuda con la pandemia, pero también resonando con algunas ideas de Marina Garcés en su libro Fuera de Clase, nos invitan a saltar los muros en que lo posible está prisionado, a pensar desde las heridas abiertas, a perder el miedo y creer en el mundo, a invocar lo poético para no escondernos frente a la catástrofe en categorías del pasado. Que en estos días el florecimiento humano nos sirva como un vórtice para aprender a querer el tiempo que nos ha, que nos ha tocado vivir, como diría Merleau-Ponty, 
y para decirlo con Gloria Ansaldúa, nos mueva del desconocimiento hacia el conocimiento, nos permita ver nuestra propia sombra y podamos hacer el trabajo que importa, porque vale la pena. Sean todos, todas y todos muy bienvenidos. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Javier, por estas palabras. Le doy ahora la bienvenida al doctor Roberto Domínguez Cáceres, decano asociado de posgrados de la Escuela de Humanidades y Educación del Tecnológico de Monterrey, para que nos comparta igualmente sus palabras de bienvenida. Adelante, doctor. Muchas gracias a todas, a todos. Buenos días. He titulado esto El Horizonte Humano. El tercer foro de estudios humanísticos tiene en su título dos palabras poderosas, horizonte y humano. Aquí hay expertos en paisajes, en puntos de vista, en conocimientos situados, pero hay, espero que haya más, aprendices de florecimiento contemporáneo. Florecer en la crisis climática, florecer con la crisis como territorio. ¿Cómo y para qué? Para eso estamos aquí, para ver cuándo y qué. El logo del foro, que verán a lo largo de toda esta semana, es para mí entre un enigma y un emblema, pues les ha dado a quienes esto organizan una identidad en medios y en redes. Felicidades porque los títulos, los temas, las preguntas que plantean nunca fueron tan fotogénicos ni tan pertinentes. Hablo o digo esto para abrir el tercer foro de estudios humanísticos de estudiantes del, del doctorado de TEC de Monterrey, porque es un evento que invita al diálogo, que propone inscribir otras definiciones a cada palabra que seleccionaron para bautizarlo. En 1992, Carlos Fuentes propuso un, emble un, un emblema de cuatro conceptos, nombre, memoria, voz, deseo. Hoy, en los estudios humanísticos contemporáneos, ese póker de conceptos queda corto. Hoy hay que pluralizar y diversificar cada concepto porque sabemos más, porque queremos saber más. No hay nombre, hay más muchas formas de nombrar. Por eso la E se puso tan a la mod que antes, ¿no? para dejar atrás las abiertas vocales de la universidad. Vieron que no tiene una sola E. Y dar paso a las peticiones, para que cada vez que alguien trate con los recursos a la mano, con las herramientas, incluso con sus limitaciones, haga evidente el esfuerzo por sumar, incluir, alternar y proponer. Dos, no hay memoria, por eso debemos inscribirla todos los días en memes, en tweets, en libros, en discos y hasta en nubes. Tres, no hay voz, hay voces. De eso se trata el diálogo. También se viene a escuchar aquí, porque es, creo yo, la escucha el más frágil de los inventos de la civilidad. Porque las orejas, como los ojos, tienen músculos que debemos ejercitar para que oigan y vean más. Como todo entrenamiento, es dependiente de la constancia y la prudencia. Esas dos ancianas venerables que desde su antes de los memes nos obligaban a sospechar que el mundo necesita más escucha y menos altavoces. Más lectura y menos streamings, menos verdad y más verdades, en plurales, discordantes, amables, valientes, discordias fructíferas. Tres, no hay deseo, hay deseos y deseantes. Por eso queremos siempre estar cerca, aun si la distancia no es sana y queremos todos ser nombrados. Hoy queremos pedirle a la normalidad su certificado de buena salud. Los estudios humanísticos permiten el florecimiento humano porque promueven la sabiduría. Casi termino. Del Neptuno alegórico de Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, que escribe para celebrar la entrada de un nuevo virrey, el Marqués de la Laguna, a la Ciudad de México en 1680, es también un enigma y emblema. Y rescato. Ahí ella explica el séptimo lienzo que trata de, cito, la célebre competencia de nuestro Neptuno tuvo con Minerva, fin de la cita, sobre para cómo poner o quién podría poner el nombre a la ciudad de Atenas. El premio se le daría a aquel o aquella que produjera el mayor beneficio a la humanidad y lo obtuvo la diosa. Neptuno hirió la tierra con su tridente en la furia y salió de él el caballo. Minerva, en cambio, ofreció un, un ramo de oliva, es decir, la paz. La paz que permite el florecimiento de las ciencias y, por tanto, vence a la guerra simbolizada en el caballo, parte animal del hombre. Pero dice más, el, al aceptarse vencido, Neptuno... Fue prueba de su sabiduría, puesto que, dice la musa, gana dos veces aquel que en la victoria se gana a sí mismo. A sí misma, a sí mismo, digo yo. Finalmente, quiero dar las gracias a la organización, al disenso y la convención, a la ocurrencia, al talento y a la planeación que hay en todas las personas que además de estudiar el posgrado hoy, han hecho que esta comisión sea un evento que hoy tiene su tercera concurrencia. La tercera esta vez no es la vencida, sino la convencida. 
porque el florecimiento se gana dos veces porque se gana uno mismo. Esta mañana celebro el empeño, el valor y la paciencia con que las virtudes y a valores de todos nosotros, todas, todes y cada uno de ustedes, cada una de ustedes, cada uno de ustedes han hecho posible para que estemos hoy aquí a la expectativa de ver qué va a florecer. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Roberto, por estas palabras. Y finalmente le cedo la palabra a la doctora Judita Aurora Ruiz Godoy Rivera, decana de la Escuela de Humanidades y Educación, para que inaugure formalmente la tercera edición del Foro de Estudios Humanísticos. Adelante, doctora, y muchas gracias. Muchas gracias a ti, Carolina. Muchas gracias a mis colegas que precedieron mis palabras. Y bueno, yo con este cubrebocas, pues, ¿qué más puedo decir que me encantaría...? que nos viéramos el rostro de manera distinta, pero esa es la realidad que vivimos y sobre la que versa también este espacio que ustedes nos han convocado y por el cual les agradezco enormemente. Hoy precisamente nos encontramos frente a uno de estos retos, la crisis de salud mundial, que nos ha puesto frente a frente con la vulnerabilidad. La realidad que antes nos parecía tan estética, tan tecnificada, pues hoy se torna incierta, se torna frágil para todas, para todos los relatos y narrativas que antes nos llamaban a la acción desde lejos por décadas, pues hoy se instauran de una manera contundente, tangibles, urgentes. Y es precisamente esta urgencia del cuestionamiento lo que nos convoca el día de hoy. La interacción con el otro que se vuelve fundamental, un estilo de vida que ya se tornó insostenible y que nos llama para poder reimaginarnos, nos llama a las humanidades como desde la acción, desde la reflexión, desde la investigación, en donde el diálogo con otras áreas y con otras disciplinas es vital. Y en este sentido, creo que este espacio al que nos convocan ¿no? nuestros estudiantes y nuestras estudiantes adquiere una importancia muy relevante, pues pone en la escena pública el papel que tienen las humanidades, no solamente en la pandemia, sino en todo lo que se ha estado detonando a partir de este tiempo de incertidumbre que ya vamos por año y medio, un poquito más el cuestionamiento desde las políticas públicas, desde un ejercicio ético, la comunicación digital, la interacción con entornos virtuales, el cuidado de sí, el cuidado del otro, desde las artes, desde otro estado de cosas, requiere nuestra atención. Celebro que nos convoquen a conversar. Celebro que nuestras y nuestros estudiantes nos inviten a esta búsqueda, a esta construcción de entornos incluyentes, sostenibles, donde existan respuestas a problemas que nos aquejan. Las humanidades debemos de estar en acción, debemos de estar en los momentos claves, recordando lo relevante que es construir los saberes, abrir huella y cerrar brechas. Construir desde la escucha, contemplar, entender la otredad. Celebro este espacio. Agradezco a todo el equipo organizador por brindarnos este tercer foro que nos permite partir con diferentes colegas por todo el mundo. Agradezco también su disposición, su tiempo, su compromiso y estoy segura que grandes iniciativas para el florecimiento humano se gestarán en esta semana dedicada a los nuevos horizontes. Pienso que a partir del diálogo podemos detonar esa inteligencia colectiva que tanto necesitamos como sociedad. Aprovechemos estos enriquecedores espacios para continuar cuestionando, imaginando y construyendo otros mundos posibles. Enhorabuena por este espacio, gracias por la invitación. Y pues que haya mucho éxito, que aprendamos mucho y que podamos construir hacia adelante. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, doctora Judith. Agradecemos enormemente su presencia, así como del resto de nuestras autoridades. Gracias por estas palabras increíbles y cálidas. Las recibimos todas, todos y todas con muchísimo cariño. Y bueno, les invitamos a disfrutar de todos los eventos que hemos preparado para esta semana llena de eventos, conferencias, paneles y talleres, donde cada uno de nuestros y nuestras ponentes nos invitarán a generar diálogos, ideas, pensamientos, conversaciones y acciones que nos inspirarán y se serán el motor para crear nuevas y mejores soluciones, nuevas y mejores formas de ser y hacer frente a estos nuevos horizontes. Sin más preámbulos, los dejo con la doctora Luz Graciela Castillo Rocha, directora del Departamento Regional de Estudios Humanísticos, quien nos presentará a nuestro gran primer conferencista de la tercera edición del Foro de Estudios Humanísticos, el doctor James Pawelski. Gracias y sean todos, todas y todes bienvenidos a esta tercera edición del Foro de Estudios Humanísticos. Muy buenos días, muchas gracias a los organizadores de este foro por esta, por esta invitación a presentar al ponente de nuestra conferencia magistral, el doctor James Pavelski. Eh, well, this 
This lecture will be developed in English. Therefore, I am going to introduce to you uh, this lecture and our uh, and, and our lecturer with uh, in English, excuse me, I am just starting. Okay, uh, this lecture, the positive humanities harnessing the power of arts and culture to promote individual and community well-being is going to um, be developed by Dr. James Pavelski. Let's, um, let's think, um, give a brief, a brief um, introduction. Then the arts and humanities are critical for human flourishing. Music, art, literature, theater, film, philosophy, history, religion, and similar cultural pursuits play central roles in the education of children, the leisure of time of adults, and the cohesion of communities, nations, and society at large. The positive humanities are a new interdisciplinary field bringing together the humanities, including the arts and the sciences to understand, assess, and advance the role of culture in human flourishing. James Pavelski, Professor of Practice and Director of the Positive Psychology Center, will present an overview of the positive humanities, explore the key findings from his groundbreaking research, and offer suggestions for future directions for the field, including how we can promote our own well-being using the power of the arts and humanities. James Pavelski is Professor of Practice and Director of Education in the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania, where he, he also serves as Adjunct Professor of Religious Studies. Having won a Fulbright Scholarship and earned a doctorate in philosophy, he is the founding director of the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project, which has been designated a National Endowment for the Arts Research Lab. He is the author, co-author, and co-editor of five books and a serious editor of the Humanities and Human Flourishing book series with Oxford University Press. An award-winning teacher, he is the founding director of Penn's Master of Applied Positive Psychology program, a past president of the William James Society, the founding executive director of the International Positive Psychology Association, and the member of the Executive Committee of the International Council for Philosophy and Humanistic Studies. Welcome, Dr. Pavelski, to Monterey Tech. I hope the audience share with me the enthusiasm I feel for listening what you are going to share with us. I, I feel so honored to, uh, to have the privilege of introducing you to the audience. Thank you very much and welcome again. Muchísimas gracias, doctora Castillo. Gracias también a Carolina Hernández y al comité organizador y a todos uh, bienvenidos que, que, que están aquí. Bueno, para mí es un honor y placer estar aquí con ustedes en este foro de niño. Viví en México, no muy lejos de Monterrey, al otro lado de Saltillo, en un ranchito que se llama El Salvador. Entonces, para mí es casi, uh, para mí estar aquí es casi como regresar a casa. So thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to be here. It has been my privilege to work with various uh, folks at uh, Tech de Monterrey and Tech Milenio over the last uh, five, six, seven years, something like that, including Salvador Alba, uh, President David Garza, Hector Escamilla, Inés Sáenz, uh, Bruno Cepeda, Luis Gutierrez, Enrique Tamés, Rosalinda Ballesteros, and so many others. I have such a deep, tremendous respect for the work that you are doing. And as a philosopher, I'm particularly honored and pleased uh, at this invitation to be able to join you at this year's Foro de Estudios Humanísticos. I would like to talk with you today about the positive humanities harnessing the power of arts and culture to promote individual and community well-being. So if we could put up the slides, then uh, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, now, it may seem strange to be talking about human flourishing, although we've already heard some great points about this from those who are introducing the photo already today. 
But there are many people who may say, why are you talking about human flourishing? Don't you know that we are in the middle of a pandemic? Don't you know that there are many problems that we are facing in our world and we need to stay focused on what those problems are and uh, on how to um, alleviate those problems? Well, I think it's important to acknowledge that we have uh, difficulties um, in our world today. Um, we always have difficulties in our world, but it seems like today we have more than our share of them. But I think that helps us to realize that it's all the more important to talk about human flourishing because we can't merely take it for granted. Uh, now, one of the challenges that we face in our world is an epidemic of loneliness that is spreading through many parts of the world. And research indicates that loneliness can be more damaging to your health than obesity, physical inactivity, or even smoking up to 15 cigarettes per day. You may know that in the United Kingdom, there has been a minister for loneliness has been appointed. One of the things that they are developing there is a notion of social prescribing. So if you go to the doctor and the doctor believes that at least part of the reason why you are there goes beyond your physical illness to uh, a kind of isolation or loneliness, the doctor can prescribe to you social connections, uh, joining a choir, for example, or visits to an art museum or other kinds of activities that can help reconnect you to your community. Dr. Vivek Morty is the US Surgeon General and uh, he has re recently written a book uh, of all the things that he could have identified as being at the root of our problems in public health. He wrote a book about loneliness, identifying that as our deepest root problem in public health. Now, all of this work in loneliness actually happened before the pandemic. And so obviously the pandemic has exacerbated these problems. Uh, we've had to uh, isolate ourselves uh, and socially distance, physically distance ourselves for a long time and in many ways. And even when we interact with each other, many times we have to uh, wear the mask, uh, which can be a further kind of barrier. Now, early on in the pandemic, you may have seen uh, pictures or videos like these of individuals, these are from Italy, where Italians went onto their balconies and shared music with each other. Um, there were um, new ways of being able to connect through the arts and humanities. Art museums went online and put their artistic treasures online so that uh, anyone would be able to access them, even if we weren't able to go to the art museums during that time. Book clubs went online or even started online as a way of bringing people together, even across the divides that were caused by the pandemic. In research that I and my team have done here at the University of Pennsylvania, we've done a nationally representative survey of adults in the United States. And we looked at the use of the humanities as a way of coping during the pandemic that was positively associated with nearly all dimensions of well-being, from positive emotions to life satisfaction, from self-efficacy to optimism, and from meaning and purpose to a sense of belonging and community. Furthermore, some of these well-being effects were stronger the more participants personally affected by COVID-19 engaged in the humanities. So this interaction effect suggests that the humanities may provide a buffer against negative psychological effects of the pandemic by supporting well-being. So I think the theme of this photo was incredibly well chosen. The arts and humanities are always important and central to our communal life. And in these days of the pandemic, they may be even more so. And if you don't believe me, 
consider for a moment a world in which we did not have arts and culture, in which we did not have the humanities. Imagine what life would be like if we didn't have music, if we didn't have narrative, literature, poetry, if we didn't have theater or film, or if we didn't have art. Can you imagine living in such a world? It would be pretty bleak. So let's bring those back onto the screen. It would be pretty bleak for all of us, but my goodness, especially for parents. Could you imagine trying to um, be a parent, but not able to sing lullabies to your children, not able to read them stories at night, not able to uh, draw with them, uh, use paintings with them to express their emotions via color, not able to watch cartoons with them. Uh, that would be really, really difficult. No, arts and culture, the humanities are a daily part of our lives. They support and sustain our well being. So, what I'd like to invite each one of you to do now is to think for a moment about the role of the arts and humanities in your own life. Can you think about a particular work of arts or humanities that has been important for your own well being? A particular song or a piece of music, a particular novel or, or poem, perhaps, or a particular movie or a work of theater or a particular work of art. So I'm just going to pause for a second. If you have something to write with and on, I invite you to write down the name of that work and then a little bit about why you think or in what ways it has supported your well-being. If you don't have something to write on, that's totally fine. Just think about how that work has supported you in your well-being in your life. All right, I'm sure some of you chose music and music is a way of being able to connect when we're by ourselves or when we're with other people, as we have seen very, very powerful as are each of these other domains. And maybe you picked a domain of arts and humanities that I didn't even mention. There are so many uh, to choose from. And these domains are really important in, their, in our lives. They're, they're carriers of vital meaning their load-bearing columns in the architecture of our souls. They're the ways in which we can connect deeply with significant others in our lives and with others in our culture, even strangers. They also form one of the foundational points of our education. And so I'm sure that as you went through school, you took courses in literature, perhaps history, uh, hopefully music uh, and other forms of the arts. And so the arts and humanities form a core part of education and have done so for a very long time. And that's why students around the world love taking courses in the arts and humanities. Uh, well, <laughs> Sometimes they do. Sometimes they are incredibly bored by courses in the arts and humanities. But how can this be? How can something that is so vital for our individual and collective well being sometimes be transformed into something that fails to connect with who we are or what we are interested in? Well, I think one part of this answer lies in the ways in which arts and humanities are used in our culture. And in the classroom, they're typically used as ways of increasing academic uh, skills. So when we're reading a novel, we're not reading a novel to be carried away by it, to be morally instructed by it, to, to go into flow as we get to know the characters that we're reading about. We read novels to increase our reading comprehension. We may read novels in different languages to increase our language abilities. We want to make sure that our spelling and our writing are up to speed. So there are very academic reasons why we oftentimes engage 
with arts and culture in the classroom. Outside of the classroom, these forms of uh, our experience are often used for economic purposes. So there is a lot of money in the music industry. In fact, we talk about industries, music industry, the movie industry, the publishing industry. And these are huge business. Billions and billions of dollars every year are brought in through these businesses. And others of us engage with arts and culture in our professional lives. And so it's our job to make sure that the um, uh, to, to engage in these uh, in these modes of culture. Now, I have nothing against um, academics. I have nothing against business. I have nothing against professional careers. But I don't think that's why we have the humanities and the arts in the first place. I think we have the arts and humanities for a deeper reason, for a much more personal much more intrinsic reason. And that is to help us be human, both to help us develop our own selves, our own sense of identity and um, our own connections with the world, and also to connect deeply with others. But it's easy for this use of the humanities or this value of the humanities. I like to call it the eudaimonic value, eudaimonia after the Greek word, for flourishing. So this eudaimonic value can get eclipsed by the academic value, the economic value, the professional value, and other values of arts and the humanities. Now, part of this is because there are people whose job it is every day to wake up and advance the academic, economic, and professional value of arts and humanities. There are metrics for seeing how well we're doing. How well are you doing in your class uh, in art or your class in literature or your class in history? What is your grade? What is your GPA? Economically, we have very clear ways of measuring the value of an artwork or how much uh, money a particular album has brought in over the course of its debut in the first year. Or we have ways of determining whether someone is ready to advance from assistant professor to associate professor in an academic context. But whose job is it to wake up every morning and to advance the eudaimonic value of the arts and humanities? How can we measure our success along those lines? How can we assess whether we are indeed benefiting in this intrinsically important way from our engagement with the arts and humanities? Well, those are exactly the kinds of questions that I and my colleagues uh, work on in the Humanities and Human Flourishing Project here at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'd like to talk with you about some of our work. But before I do that, I wanna just uh, talk basically about what the humanities are and then kind of go from there. Now we could talk for uh, the entire photo uh, debating definitions of the humanities. That's a challenging uh, uh, area to define adequately. But I'd just like to uh, offer a couple of basic ways of coming at this. So oftentimes the humanities are defined in terms of the disciplines that they include. Um, traditionally, they've included philosophy, literature, history, religion, ancient and modern languages, law, theater, art, and music. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary defines the humanities as, quote, the branch of learning concerned with human culture. The branch of learning concerned with human culture. Well, so what does culture mean? Well, the Oxford English Dictionary defines it as the distinctive ideas, customs, social behavior, products, or way of life of a particular society, people, or period. Or it can also be defined as the arts and other manifestations of human intellectual achievement regarded collectively. Now, as we think about uh, the humanities, they have a very long history, going back at least to the Greek paideia 
and to the Roman artes liberales, the liberal arts. These were programs of education that the ancient uh, uh, world had for training young people to become citizens, for training them in how to flourish and how to be uh, successful contributors to the civic life of the city and the state. It was uh, in the Italian Renaissance, however, that the humanities more specifically became identified as its own program of education. And this was uh, following the work of Petrarch, who was an Italian poet, uh, thinker, and writer. And he lived during a pandemic. There's a real sense in which the humanities are the gift of a pandemic. Now, Petrarch lived during the Black Death, a horrific pandemic where it's estimated that up to 200 million people in Europe and Northern Africa were killed by the pandemic. It was utterly devastating to those who lived at that time. And Petrarch was one of them. And he looked to the education of his day, the scholasticism that was presented in universities, which he argued had become technical, had become more about academics and more about acad academic problems than it was about life and the problems and possibilities of life. And so Petrarch was dissatisfied with this. He said, I need something to help me live my life. I can't simply get caught up in these academic questions. I need something stronger. So he looked back to the Roman and the Greek classics. And he began to read them, not merely as a way of, you know, writing dissertations and getting doctoral degrees and advancing through the academic hierarchy, but rather as a way of being able to live his life, uh, be, being able to cope with what was happening with the pandemic and to find ways of living life well. So he developed a certain approach to these classics and he, in collaboration with others, continued the development of that and eventually that became known as the humanities and this humanistic uh, uh, program of education then spread quickly throughout Europe. So I wanna talk with you today about something that I call the positive humanities, the positive humanities, thinking specifically about how to connect the humanities and human flourishing. So if the humanities are the branch of learning concerned with human culture, the positive humanities are the branch of learning concerned with human culture in its relation to human flourishing. The positive humanities are a new field of inquiry and practice concerned with the relationship between culture and human flourishing. Now, if you think about those two words, culture and human flourishing, they're actually botanical metaphors culture coming from the Latin for cultivate. So you cultivate a field. And if that cultivation is successful, then it results in the flourishing of the plants that you're trying to grow. So metaphorically, human culture, if it is successful, should result in the flourishing of human beings. So positive humanities, but what is the positive. Does that just refer to smiling all the time, rainbows, butterflies, pretending like there's nothing in the world uh, that is a problem? Uh, what exactly do we mean by the positive? Well, let's stay with the agrarian metaphor and think about a garden or, or a farm. Uh, what is it that you have to do in order to have uh, a result of flourishing plants? Well, the first thing you need to do, uh, you need to pull weeds. It's really important to pull weeds, but if all you do is pull weeds, you will not end up with a garden, you will end up with a pile of dirt. So it's also essential to plant seeds. We need to plant the seeds of the, plant, of the uh, things that we want to harvest uh, come harvest time. And um, however, if all we do is plant seeds, then we're likely to get 
weeds, who are very hardy plants and love to choke out the plants that we are trying to cultivate. So clearly what we need to do is both. We need to plant the seeds and we need to pull the weeds. I like to think of planting seeds as directly positive activity. This is activity that is in the direction of what we want, but it also has to be balanced with things that are indirectly positive, things that reduce or mitigate or alleviate the things that we don't want. And so to my mind, the positive is not pretending that there's no such thing as weeds. Uh, rather, the positive is acknowledging that we need to have a balance. We need to be realistic about the world that we live in. And we need to be optimistic about what we can do in that world, how we can change the world by our efforts as individuals, as groups, as society to make the world more in the direction in which we would want to have it. So a word further about what we mean by human flourishing and, and what we don't mean. When, when we think about the word flourishing, literally coming from flowering, florecer, right? There is a moment in the life of plants or a moment in the year of the, 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 the plant cycle where plants flourish. But it's also important to understand that what we mean by flourishing is not just that moment, but also the entire life cycle. So if trees, for example, uh, are flourishing in the springtime, that's great. But where I am now in Philadelphia, the trees uh, 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 here in the city and outside my window, they are not flowering. If they were flowering now, that would not be flourishing. That would be deeply problematic because winter is coming. No, the trees here are losing their leaves. And that's an important part of the flourishing, the overall well-being of the trees. So we want to celebrate and enjoy the moments when the literal flowers are on the plants, but we also want to appreciate and value other parts of the cycle of the plant. So positive humanities are not just about, they are about times of celebration and joy, but they're not just about that. They're also about times of challenge and resilience. When we talk about flourishing, we can talk about flourishing plants, we can talk about flourishing gardens. We can talk about flourishing ecosystems. And I know this is something that is uh, 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 Hector Escamilla and, and the whole uh, Tec Milenio and Tec de Monterrey is thinking about how to create not just uh, individuals who flourish, not just to support students and faculty and administrators and staff, but how to create together an ecosystem of flourishing. Look, if there's a garden and only one half or one part of the plants have the sunlight and the water they need to flourish, that garden is not flourishing. So it's crucial in our social systems that we look to every member and every type of every group to make sure that they have what they need to flourish. We need to think about commonalities and differences in flourishing, right? So there are some commonalities, there are some things that all human beings need. All human beings need to have healthy contact and support with other people. We need to have friends. We need to have um, companions. We need to interact with other people. That may be the most important thing in human flourishing is the social context in which we find ourselves, even if we're alone, because we have access to memories, we have access to language, we have access to the humanities, perhaps, uh, things that other people have thought and written about and uh, uh, art, works of art that they have created in the past, even if we're not with them in the moment. So there are commonalities. There are also differences. There are individual differences, the specifics of the number, the kind and number of, uh, of friends that I need to be healthy may be different from the kinds and numbers of friends that you would like to have. There are individual differences. There are also group differences. And it's important to understand what these group differences are to make sure that we have the full range of understanding that we need for supporting human flourishing. Human flourishing is not synonymous with privilege. Privilege does not guarantee flourishing. There are plenty of people who have privilege who are not flourishing. On the other hand, privilege often obstructs flourishing. It oftentimes gets in the way of the kind of society we need that is a flourishing one. 
Another very important point is that flourishing and languishing are bivariate. They're not opposites of each other in the sense that if you're not flourishing, you're languishing. If you're not languishing, you're flourishing. That's too simple of a way of thinking about it. My guess is that in your life, there are areas in which you are flourishing and there may be areas in which you feel like you're languishing. You're not quite there yet. That's certainly how I experience my life. And so um, it's complex. Uh, and we want to understand what flourishing is. We want to help to cultivate those parts of our lives, but then also uh, uh, acknowledge that there may also be some areas that are languishing where we need to do uh, some different kind of work, perhaps pulling weeds or perhaps bringing some extra water or sunshine. And of course, when I talk about human flourishing, I don't mean human in the sense of excluding the non-human world. Clearly, uh, our flourishing is implicated in the flourishing of plants and animals, the, 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 the large ecosystem, planet Earth, uh, and so forth. And that flourishing is important in its own right. Okay, so I'd like to share with you a quotation from Natalie Bondil, who's the former director general and chief curator at the Montreal Museum of Arts. And she has said, I am convinced that in the 21st century, culture will be to health what sports were in the 20th century. Cultural experiences will be seen to contribute to our well being the same way sports do to our physical conditioning. I think that is a wonderful quotation. Now, a hundred years ago, it wasn't clear to many people that sports were important for well being, especially for me, especially for women. It, you might not want to go out and be too, um, too energetic in your exercise, people thought, if you are a woman. Today, we understand that exercise is important for everyone. And part of the reason for that shift in thinking is the scientific advances that have helped us to see uh, more, to learn more about the health benefits of exercise. And so I think that there will be a number of uh, uh, factors that are important to bring this shift that Natalie Bondil envisions. But one of them will be the scientific research to help understand the various ways in which cultural experiences can support our well being. Now, there are a number of policy recommendations that are beginning to be made in our world. Uh, I'll just take a couple of examples here the All Party Parliamentary Group on Arts, Health, and Well Being in the UK uh, published the, a report called Creative Health The Arts for Health and Well Being. Uh, they write uh, there is an expanding body of evidence to support the contention that the arts have an important contribution to make to health and well-being. Also in the UK, the What Work Center for Well-Being uh, uh, creates and publishes systematic reviews and policy reports on visual arts, uh, music, dance. And they report that listening to music can alleviate anxiety and improve well-being in young adults. Listening to music can reduce stress, negative moods, and state anxiety in healthy adults. Regular group singing can enhance morale and mental health related quality of life and reduce loneliness, anxiety, and depression in older people compared with usual activities. These are really important findings. However, more research is needed. Also in the Creative Health Report, they write evidence is unevenly distributed across the field, is of variable quality, and is sometimes inaccessible. So what are the specific health and well-being outcomes to which participation in the arts can lead? Under what circumstances are these outcomes likely to be achieved? What are the mechanisms, the pathways through which these positive outcomes can be obtained? Are there situations in which the arts and uh, humanities do not improve health and well-being? Are there occasions in which they're actually detrimental to them? What are the processes by which we may be able to increase and even optimize the positive effects of the arts and humanities on well-being? Well, these are just the kinds of questions that we are investigating in the art and the humanities and human uh, humanities and human flourishing project here at the University of Pennsylvania. Back in 2000, uh, I was fortunate uh, to find out about the first public meeting that was going to be held in positive psychology. Uh, and so I attended and I was so deeply moved to hear about positive psychology and the emphasis of using psychological methodologies to understand and cultivate more effectively 
uh, human flourishing. And I realized that as a philosopher, the things that I was already engaged in were, could really be understood as the positive humanities. And so uh, I eventually came to the University of Pennsylvania, invited here by Martin Seligman, who is the founder of the field of positive psychology, because he wanted to, uh, to found a master's program in positive psychology. And he invited me here to Penn to help him develop it and then to direct and teach in the program. We're now in our 17th year of that program. Uh, Rosalinda Ballesteros, for example, is one of our graduates. So in 2011, I began teaching a course on the humanities and human flourishing in our master's program. In 2014, we got our first uh, research grant, and our emphasis was to understand and enhance the effects of engagement in the arts and humanities on the well-being of individuals and communities. We were uh, we have a collaborative approach across disciplines and modalities within the arts and humanities, history and literature and philosophy, for example, but then also across divides between science and the arts and humanities. It's important with something as foundational as human flourishing that we not maintain our silos uh, of research uh, separating the uh, arts and humanities from the sciences. We Early on, we published a couple of books, The Eudaimonic Turn, Well-Being and Literary, Literary Studies, and a poetry anthology on human flourishing. So I'd just like to give you an overview of our current work at this point. Uh, we are working in areas of theory, research, and practice. At the level of theory, we're working on conceptual and instrumental development. We are creating a growing network. At this point, there are more than 150 leading scholars, researchers, and professionals who have been involved. We're um, writing foundational publications about this work. We're really grateful for initial support from the University of Pennsylvania and the Templeton Religion Trust. At the level of research, we're engaging in basic scientific investigation, looking at the mechanisms governing the well being effects of the arts and humanities. What are the specific pathways by which these effects occur? Um, we are, have been designated a national endowment for the arts research lab. We're grateful for collaboration with the Heinz Endowments uh, located in Pittsburgh uh, in the United States. And we're currently looking for further opportunities, uh, further funding, further collaboration to extend our research uh, into the future. And then at the level of practice, dissemination and application, we're working with cultural organizations, schools, universities, and governments to optimize the well-being effects of the arts and humanities. This is a picture of our initial uh, humanities and human flourishing team. We have been joined more recently by a couple of postdocs, uh, Catherine Cotter and Damian Crone. One of the things we were able to do is to bring together groups of scholars across uh, eight different disciplines in the arts and humanities, philosophy, history, religious studies and theology, literary studies, art, music, theater, and film to discuss ways in which their discipline and their work within that discipline uh, can add to the conceptualization and the cultivation of human flourishing. We're now in the process of bringing together chapters, essays that were written by each of those contributors into volumes. So we have a book series with Oxford University Press, and over the course of the next year or two, we will be publishing a volume of collected essays in each of these disciplines by way of sharing what we learned in our discussions together and by way of inviting others to join us as well. Here is a um, model that we created, a conceptual model to bring together the uh, research on arts and humanities engagement. You look at the left-hand side um, and then on the right-hand side of the slide, the human flourishing outcomes. And then in the middle, what is it that um, takes us from engagement with these uh, cultural activities to a whole variety of human flourishing outcomes that we're interested in? Uh, this information will be on the test at the end of this uh, lecture, so please be sure to take notes. No, of course not. Um, I show it to you just very briefly uh, because um, it's some of you I know are interested in empirical research, uh, and you can find out more about that in our publications. So how does engagement with arts and culture improve well-being? We've identified five different um, 
mechanisms, five different pathways. I'll read through them uh, just briefly today. And I would, would invite you to think about the um, exemplar, the artifact, the cultural artifact that you identified at the beginning of uh, the hour that was important for your own well-being and see whether this describes any of your experience with that artifact. So first of all, we think that arts and humanities engagement uh, leads to human flourishing in part through immersion. This is where your attention is fully captured by the immediacy of the experience. You disconnect from the worries of everyday life. You feel carried away. Now, this is especially important and especially challenging in our day when it's easy to get distracted. It's easy to flit from thing to thing, but we think that really paying attention, allowing yourself to get immersed in a work of art, a piece of music, a work of literature is really important for human flourishing. Second is expression. This is where you're able to externalize your thoughts and feelings, oftentimes becoming more aware of them in the process. Acquisition, this is where you have experiences that result in enduring insights, skills, or habits. For example, mastery experiences that leave you with uh, 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 skills that you can use for the rest of your life. So immersion is a momentary experience. Acquisition is enduring. Then there's socialization. This is where you're able to understand more clearly who you are, what your identity is, and what roles you play in your community and culture, and how you can connect with others. And then finally, reflection. Um, the unexamined life is not worth living, Socrates said. Uh, this is where you're empowered to intentionally reinforce uh, adaptive habits, values, and worldviews, and to transform maladaptive ones. We've created a toolkit of measures to assess the effects of each of these mechanisms in our experiences. And I'm really excited to share with you that we have edited the Oxford Handbook of the Positive Humanities, which is due out very soon. It's due out in December of this year, 2021. There are 38 chapters. Some of them are conceptual chapters. Most of them focus in on a review and synthesis of theory, research, and empirical evidence on how the arts and humanities can contribute to human flourishing. So I recommend, if this is an area of interest to you, that you uh, check out the Oxford Handbook uh, when it is published. Just very briefly, a few examples of our current research. Uh, we're looking to the effects of humanities courses on well-being. One of my colleagues here at the University of Pennsylvania, Justin McDaniel, a former chair of the Religious Studies Department, teaches a course he calls Living Deliberately, which uh, examines monastic practices throughout uh, history and across cultures, not just academically and intellectually, but experientially. So he asks his students to wean themselves from technology, to wean themselves from speaking, um, to be very deliberate about what they eat. I think by the end of the semester, they may be weaned off of oxygen, I'm not sure, uh, but it's a very intense experience. And so we have teamed up with him to look at what are the well-being effects of a course that brings his students into that experience so deeply. Interestingly, even though you might think that in those moments when, in those times when students are asked to be off of technology, not to be speaking to others, to spend a lot of time in contemplation, actually they feel less lonely, less lonely in those times. Loneliness is not just a function of being with other people. It's a quality of how we live our lives and how aware we are of our own experience and the experience of others. We're looking at the effects of narrative technologies on well-being. Angus Fletcher is a professor of, uh, is a literature professor at Ohio State University. He's written a book called Wonder Works. He focuses on narrative technologies. How can particular ways in which stories are written help to cultivate awe or courage or creativity in us? So we're, we're working with him to uh, on a series of empirical studies to see what those effects might be. And then finally, effects of art museum visits on well-being. We're collaborating with the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, we've been delayed a bit because of COVID. Uh, so in the process, we're also uh, helping to develop a virtual art museum lab. We call it the VAM lab. And uh, we're looking at how engagement with art, even in a virtual context, 
can help to have a variety of effects on human flourishing. We're collaborating with the Universidad de Milenio, the Instituto de Ciencias del Bienestar y la Felicidad to look at uh, positive museum tours that they have created in their network. And we're looking to uh, work with them to measure the well-being effects of those museum tours. So in conclusion, I want to share with you a brief story about what happened to one of my students to illustrate how uh, arts and culture can, uh, how the humanities can help us flourish in our lives. So um, before the pandemic, uh, in this humanities and human flourishing class I taught, uh, I teach in our master's program, I would take my students to an art museum, the, the Barnes Foundation here in Philadelphia. Uh, during the pandemic, we do this virtually. Uh, but what I ask the students to do is to take a look at the work that is there and to focus in on one particular work that they find speaks to them in some way or, or, is, or is compelling in some way. So one of my students, Julie, uh, when we went to the Barnes Foundation, saw this painting. It is the uh, Amont Rouge, Rosa La Rouge, from, uh, by Toulouse-Lautrec. And so she chose this painting. I asked them then to stand in front of this painting for at least 20 minutes, the painting that they choose, and to think about it from the framework, not just the art historical uh, background of it, but from what it can tell them about human flourishing and about their own flourishing. We have a way of, of preparing a kind of framing of this experience that we go through to talk about possible connections between uh, art and human flourishing. So Julia stood in front of this work and she, as she looked at it, she thought, you know, this person, this woman in this painting looks sad. Um, but why would I have chosen this painting? I I'm not sad. Wait a minute, Julie realized. I am sad. Well, well, why am I sad? I'm sad because of my work, she said. Now, Julie is actually Dr. Julie Hayslip, and she at that time was a pediatric care specialist at the University of Virginia Medical Center. So if anybody should find their work fulfilling and meaningful, you would think it would be Julie. But she didn't feel like she could bring her full self to work. She wanted to do different things. She wanted to bring resilience work to caregivers who were on the verge of being burnt out. And in the current work that she was doing, there was just no time for that. So Julie continued to look at the painting 20 minutes can be a long time if you're looking at a painting. Uh, it can seem like a long time. And Julie said, you know, not only is this woman, does this woman look sad, but she looks determined. And furthermore, it looks like behind her in the painting, there's some kind of door or window. She could leave wherever it is that she is, and she could change her circumstances if she, if she wanted to. I'm determined, Julie thought. I could change my circumstances if I wanted to. And so when Julie left the museum, she bought a print of this painting from the gift shop and took it home with her. Well, about six years later, I ran into Julie Hayslip at a meeting. It was the Sixth World Congress on Positive Psychology held in 2019 in Melbourne, Australia. And I said to Julie, you've got to tell me the rest of the story. Like what happened? Was this just an interesting moment of immersion or did it change your life in some way? And Julie said, it absolutely changed my life. I went home, I called up the nursing school at the University of Virginia Medical Center. And I realized that at the nursing school, there would be more opportunities for me to, 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 to do the work that I feel called to do. And so they created a brand new position for her. Julie took a $50,000 a year pay cut and began doing work that she found fulfilling supporting her own life, uh, uh, her own flourishing, and the flourishing of those that she worked with. So that's just one example, one way in which art can be transformative and support our flourishing. If you're interested in reading more about the course and more about Julie's experience, we were interviewed by a columnist for the New York Times, uh, and, and the, uh, the experience was written up in The Art of Slowing Down in a Museum by Stephanie Rosenblum. 
This is a picture of Benoit Dubé. He is the, the, the first chief wellness officer appointed at the University of Pennsylvania. And he has uh, been a great collaborator with us, has joined our research team, because he believes uh, and understands that arts, the humanities are crucial for well-being in a campus context. This is a picture of uh, one of the classes in the Master of Applied Positive Psychology program in which I teach the courses on the humanities and human flourishing. If any of you are interested uh, to find out more about uh, our master's program and the various offerings that we have in positive psychology, you can find out more at positivepsychology.org. This is a, a, a picture from a class um, that I taught, an undergraduate class on uh, the pursuit of happiness, where I brought together uh, positive psychology with uh, the positive humanities in that context uh, as well. So we are collaborating with museums, we're collaborating uh, with, um, uh, with, with governments. Um, the bottom right corner is a picture from Adelaide, Australia. And Adelaide invited me to spend four weeks working with the city government a couple of years ago to look at ways in which their engagement, they're known as the city of festivals because they have so many arts and music uh, festivals. Um, and they wanted to know how could we bring more uh, knowledge and understanding and scientific research to this experience of our festivals so that they can be even more effective at supporting the flourishing of our uh, of our citizens. We prepared a report, uh, which is now uh, published online. If you'd like more information about that, you can check out the uh, government site at the um, in Adelaide, Australia. So with that, um, I will just um, end by saying that it. I am excited again to be able to talk with you about this research. Uh, it's important for ourselves. It's important for our world. It's important for us to be able to work together in this domain so that we can um, cultivate our own flourishing, cultivate the flourishing of our communities, our organizations, our schools, uh, and more broadly, our planet as well. If you'd like more information about the work that we're doing here at Penn, please visit www.humanitiesandhumanflourishing.org. Um, and with that, uh, I will stop. I think there might be time for, for a couple of questions. Again, thank you so very much for your attention and for the invitation to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, James, for this uh, presentation. I think it's been a clever and challenging presentation because it's challenging because I, I feel that I have to, to do something about my way of getting um, involved with the students and then um, trying to um, develop better experiences and lead uh, young people to learn how to engage these experiences in order to uh, develop self-awareness, self-esteem, and self-management because uh, all this about the human flourishing depends on the capacities of the seed to develop and flourish. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I have some questions from the audience. Uh, the first of, of them is from Stefania Arcadia. Uh, she, she, she says, Dr. Pavelski, Pavelski, excuse me, it seems to me that some of the most discussed topics in academia today are related to decolonialism. Many academics are more interested in showing the mistakes from the past, trying to balance things from communities who suffer in the past and today. If this is true and right, how can positive humanities, humanities being so rooted in the past and in tradition, be a relevant part of the current academic conversations? Terrific, thank you. That is indeed a, a, a great question. Um, and so I would go back to the um, uh, to the botanical metaphor of what culture and flourishing uh, are about. And so if you think about um, any kind of farming or gardening, there are going to be complexities. There are going to be um, plants that uh, that that we want to have in the garden. Let's say flowers, um, vegetables, and so forth. And there are also going to be weeds. 
uh, that kind of come in and um, and infest the garden. There are going to be within those plants that we um, that we want to have. There are going to be some plants that do better than others, uh, and you know sometimes we're going to have to prune the plants. So if you have fruit fruit trees, sometimes cutting them back is a way of actually allowing them to flourish forward. So I don't think there's any easy answer to the question that was asked. It's a complex work. And I don't think that we should merely, um, as I mentioned, I, I, positive humanities is not about merely ignoring the problems, uh, merely saying plant seeds, don't worry about pulling weeds, but it's about insisting on balance. And so if we simply dismiss the past as being problematic because of colonial practices, or if we simply embrace the past as some kind of golden age where people were flourishing, then we're not really studying the past as closely as we need to. Uh, and so that holds true for the future as well. If we simply look to the future to try to think about the things that we should avoid, then that's not going to be what we need to take us where we need to be. Conversely, if all we do is um, in a kind of, um, you know, shallow way, just talk about uh, only the things that we like, then we may miss out on the work that needs to be done in mitigating the problems that we have. So the positive humanities tries to argue for a, a broad approach, a careful approach, not just one particular perspective, but balance so that we can uh, move in the direction of the individual and collective flourishing we all want. Thank you very much. Uh, there is another question. Uh, Dr. Pavelski, is flourishing an essential characteristic in the human being? Uh, that's a very great question. Uh, I guess that depends on what we mean by essential, right? Um, I suppose it's, a, it's possible to live as a human being uh, in a case, in a state of languishing. Uh, where we may be subject to physical illness, um, we may be subject to mental illness, uh, we may experience uh, 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 social upheaval and, and, and social uh, a negative social context. So uh, when we say essential, if we mean that is it possible to live as a human being without flourishing, um, that's probably possible. Uh, although I think in most lives, uh, even lives of great difficulty. There are some places uh, of flourishing. Think about the flower that pushes through the rocks or that pushes through the crack in the sidewalk, uh, for example. But if we think about the essential in the sense of what human beings um, uh, most are and what our potential is, then I would say that it's hard for me to imagine a term or a concept that is more essential to our lives than flourishing. Thank you. Um, a third question. What are the implications of the precariousness of artistic and cultural work in the current market and its concentration in large capitals and digital platforms? It is possible that these expressions may be transformed and, and, and that they role as drivers of human flourishing change? Yes, uh, great, great question. Look, even before the pandemic, there was an unacceptable precarity in terms of the arts, arts makers, creators, and so forth. Oftentimes, this work was not sufficiently valued. Um, and sometimes when it was valued, um, it was valued in kind of a winner takes all kind of fashion, right? So if you are a famous artist, then you can sell your work for millions of dollars even. But for the rest of us, uh, good luck trying to make enough uh, to get by uh, and to sustain your practice. I think that the pandemic has revealed two things even more powerfully to all of us. One is how essential the arts and humanities are. I wouldn't even want to imagine the last couple of years without having access to music, without having access to art and literature, uh, and without being able to share these things with others. So I think there's a real turning point um, in understanding how essential these uh, culture is for, for us. The other piece I think that's been abundantly clear is um, that we do not yet as a society have the right structure 
for supporting this work and for supporting those who are engaged in this work. So I hope that uh, as we move forward, one of the ways in which our world will be different in the future than it was uh, a couple of years ago is making more time for arts and the humanities, valuing it more as a society, and thus being able to find ways of supporting those who are engaged in it. I see very promising signs of this. I see promising signs, for example, in the health uh, world. So hospitals looking to the work of musicians and artists as part of the healing process and also as part of the research process. The World Health Organization has launched a uh, an arts and healing initiative. Uh, and so there is much more attention being paid to how uh, how the arts and of course the, the, the broader humanities uh, can help to heal, uh, but then also I would say can help us to grow into the future. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, th there is always uh, a discussion about uh, this, this um, values you stated at the, at the beginning, the eudaimonic value against economic or professional or even social value of uh, the, what we produce. Uh, we have a fourth question. In, in a situated point of view, for example, in the scenario of a structural, cultural and direct violence that women experience throughout the world, and particularly in the context of the pandemic, what is the political potential of the notion of the human flourishing from the positive perspective you have shared with us? Another terrific, terrific question. Um, and I, I guess I would say, again, it's a question of balance, right? And so if all we do is focus in on trying to identify uh, situations that are not just, that are not okay, um, we can, you know, there's a lot of work to be done there in, in identifying those things. To my mind, that's important, but not sufficient. Because simply shining a spotlight on problems, that's not, that's not what we want. We don't just want to see those problems. That's a first step. Um, another step, of course, is taking action to try to change those problems. But another way of coming at this also, uh, which I think is a complementary way, is spending at least as much time looking at what is it that we want? And are there examples of that in the world concretely? And are there examples, recent examples, of shifts that have been made already where people in this um, negative, unjust kind of an environment have been able to move into a more just uh, world? And so um, uh, Kim Cameron, one of my colleagues in, in positive organizational studies, talks about uh, positive deviance. So we can focus on looking at what's wrong, that's important, but isn't it just as important at fo to focus on positive deviance? What are those situations where we would expect the situation to be problematic and negative and awful? And somehow it isn't. Somehow things are different in that context. And if we can understand what's different about that situation, maybe we can then help that to grow, help that to kind of take over. Again, going back to the garden metaphor, we could spend all of our time looking at the plants that aren't growing. We could also spend at least some of our time looking at the plants that are growing and trying to understand why they're growing. Maybe it's that they have you know, more sunlight and maybe we can then broaden that out to, uh, to the rest of the plants. But again, I think it's a balance. Uh, complementary approaches are really necessary. And it's easy because of the compelling and, you know, um, because of how um, awful these situations are that we can encounter, that our attention can become fully absorbed in them. And I think that can sometimes be problematic because it can sometimes keep us from seeing the possibilities that might actually help us all move in the direction that we want to move. Thank you very much. Uh, one last question. And Dr. Pavelski, what do you what do you think about people making their own creations, drawings, collage, etc., 
Were there or not those creations are framed in the art institution to improve well-being? Oh, that is a fantastic question. I'm really glad uh, for that one. This is so important. Um, I know when I was in, in high school, if somebody had asked me if I was creative, I would have said absolutely not because I can't draw, right? I can draw stick figures, you know, that's about it. Um, I come from my parents. My mother is a wonderful singer. My dad can't sing. And so for me, some days I'm more like my mom, but a lot of days I'm more like my dad. Um, and uh, sometimes I can feel like, whoa, I mean, since I live in a world which has Picassos and Pavarotti's in it, I can't take up a uh, paints or, or, or colored crayons. I can't sing. That's something that the professionals should do. And I believe that that is a real problem. It's wonderful to see Picasso's work. It's wonderful to hear Pavarotti sing, but that shouldn't stop us. I believe the arts and humanities are our birthright. I believe that as human beings, we should sing, maybe in the shower, uh, maybe uh, maybe not everybody needs to sing in a choir, um, but uh, but you should sing if you feel so um, um, so moved. And 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 even if you don't, like just try it. Singing can be such a wonderful way of expressing ourselves, regardless of whether you're on tune, forget the words or not. If you're not, you know, if you're like me and you really aren't good at drawing or painting, make collages put color on paper. There are all kinds of things that we can do to help express ourselves, to help connect uh, with those aspects of our lives that certainly some people are able to do incredibly well. Uh, and everybody can do well to the extent that it's an expression of how we're feeling and who we are. Thank you very much. I, I think it's also a learning outcome. We have to learn from ourselves that uh, we have the opportunity and the possibility to, to develop all these uh, capacities in order to feel better and make the people feel better and take care of uh, the, the world and the, and, the, and the environment we are living on. Uh, I think um, this, uh, all this conversation invites us to, to become aware of the necessity of express ourselves to develop compassion, care and forgiveness in order to uh, develop a better life for each one of us. Thank you very much, Dr. Pavelski, for this lecture uh, in behalf of the organizers i i am so grateful for this uh, these moments we, you have shared with us and uh, i am presenting a recognition a certificate of participation in this third forum of uh, humanistic studies and this this being a great beginning for a great day and a great week thank you very much for making uh, for all of us, Dr. Pavelski, uh, a great day and give us a sense of hope for continuing what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. ¿Te gustó esta conferencia? Este y otros temas son los que se abordan en el doctorado en estudios humanísticos en el Tecnológico de Monterrey, Campus Monterrey y Campus Ciudad de México. Si te interesa este programa, entra a bit.ly diagonal info me o bit.ly diagonal info de o envía un correo a fatima.tech.mx Te recordamos que a la una de la tarde tendremos la transmisión en vivo del taller Comunicación, Retórica y Humanismo ante un nuevo horizonte cultural, ofrecido por el doctor.